How do we understand war, violence, and evil in the 21st century? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this episode, we explore violence in its many forms and its psychological underpinnings. We're going to play for you an interview we conducted with Dr. Jerry Piven. He teaches in the Department of Philosophy at Rutgers University. Three of his most notable books are Slaughtering Death on the Psychoanalysis of Terror, Religion, and Violence, The Psychology of Death in Fantasy and History, and Death and Delusion, a Freudian Analysis of Mortal Terror. He has published over 50 papers in the past decade. He's currently working on a book to be titled Pious Massacre, Literary Violence from Dostoevsky to Mishima. Here's Dr. Piven. Welcome, Dr. Piven. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Jerry, to what degree does fear of death produce violence? Well, most social scientists would probably tell you not at all. Ernest Becker is pretty unusual in believing that death has a role to play. Theories of evil abound in social science. Uh, one of the most famous philosophical arguments has to do with the banality of evil. Hannah Arendt said that most people will commit evil acts if they are socially acceptable. She studied Eichmann, the Nazi war criminal, and found that uh, he would commit evil acts, that is to say he would order the, the death of Jews and participate in this uh, horrific Nazi process uh, without feeling any real sense of guilt. In fact, uh, Eichmann was somewhat ambivalent about this, at times thought that if he had really done his job correctly, he would have uh, continued to execute Jews until they were no more, and on the other hand, sometimes thought that he wasn't to blame at all because he was just following orders. Was he trying to save the world or trying to protect the purity of the Aryan race from the from the Jews and the you know and the, these other races that polluted them? Well, certainly Hitler and many of his followers thought that they were exterminating uh, a Jewish virus, these syphilitic vermin, and so forth. But Arendt claims uh, with Eichmann that uh, enough people are just claiming to follow orders, and therefore human beings will do what is socially acceptable. As long as some authority says, this is okay, this is acceptable, this is the ethical thing to do, then people can do horrific acts. Now, there are other theories besides this, aside from the idea that people do what is socially acceptable, although this may have some truth to it. There are other theories. Uh, Lani Athens has the theory, for example, that People are more disposed to violence from a process of child abuse and neglect, which he calls violentization. Some people would have us uh, believe, and I think there might be something to this, that children who are nurtured and loved uh, are less inclined to commit violent acts compared to those who have been beaten or abused or who have been humiliated throughout their lives. Now, while there seems to be evidence that violent perpetrators or even criminals uh, have had uh, childhoods full of various kinds of neglect, possibly even abuse. They have had painful childhoods. What Becker brings to this is something uh, that I think is, is worth saying because it is not mentioned at all in the social sciences. First of all, he says, while it may be the case that some kids who are abused or have, have uh, more painful childhoods are inclined to commit violent acts, he also says that the people who have committed uh, acts of violence throughout history, not just the anomalous criminals in society, not just those strange lurking murderers in the darkness, not these very strange freaky type of murderers, not Jeffrey Dahmer, but the murders that constitute the bloodbath of history or the nightmare of history, as uh, Norman Brown says. Right? These people are not the anomalous, strange, aberrant few, but these are happy people. Not psychopaths, per se, have committed all these bloodbaths. We're talking about Nazi genocide, genocide of uh, the Armenians, uh, all of the kind of uh, horrors that went on, went on in Rwanda and in Bosnia and Serbia and so forth, that the people who, who commit these acts are obviously not the fringes of society. These are uh, normal, uh, right, average right. citizens, right? So Becker says, how is this possible? Well, uh, according to him, uh, we need an explanation which is not about the, the few, but about how so many of us under certain conditions can become horrifically violent. People who seem ethical, who seem to be loving, they love their children, they 
might even find violence morally reprehensible under other conditions. So how is this possible? Becker says, it's not just these strange anomalous few, but happy, jolly people who have laid waste to the planet. And historically speaking, there's something to this. Yes, some people have resisted. There are always those people who refuse to participate. There are those people who refuse to help the Nazis. But it is a fascinating process how so many people can not only sort of go along with it, but can participate in it actively. Wow. All right. Okay. And what does yeah. the fear of death have to do with that? That's the kind of the heart of Becker's. Right. Yeah, Becker theory. says the fear of death is a mainspring of human right. activity. Well, Can this is just say it. Say a little more about that. If we fear death, and Becker claims that we fear death not exactly to the same degree, we're not all the same, but if the fear of death is a, a, a part and parcel of the human condition, if we're all terrified not only of death per se, not just the abstract concept, but if we're terrified of non-being, if we're terrified of decay, of putrescence, of rotting and, and moldering in the grave, if we are terrified at the thought of what death means and our own insignificance and the fact that we are transient, we will pass away and be nothing, all of us to some degree are terrified of this on some level. And that the way to conquer this fear is to act it out on other people by conquering death. We trample the guts of other people. We stomp them into the, the earth and say death has now afflicted them and not us. And we are masters of death through this violence. I'm a master of, I'm a master of, of fate and that I can, I can kill. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And furthermore... And this is a terribly important component that, that, again, though we vary in terms of, of how much we fear death, uh, the more we are threatened by the fear of death, the more we are inclined to respond violently in a paranoid way. Uh, we deem ourselves uh, threatened by a force of evil that we must conquer. And our reaction to being threatened is to become somewhat violent. Now, as empirical studies have now shown in terror management the past uh, decade or so, worldview itself, our beliefs about the universe, are amplified and strengthened to the degree to which we are afraid of death or momentarily terrified by something that threatens us. This being the case, we have to ask, under what conditions are we so terrified that we are going to respond in an uncharacteristically violent way, that we are not fully in control of our rational faculties, but are so threatened that we need to act this out violently and dominate death by killing in some sort of bloodbath that really seems to possess us? How about heroism, now? How does, how does heroism fit into this overcoming the, the fear of death? Well, Becker says that heroism is first and foremost a reflex of the terror of death. Now, one has to understand that when Becker is talking about heroism, he can mean several things. He's not saying that any act of being brave, anything that would be deemed altruistic in a heroic way, must be uh, the result of terror. He's not reducing everything to somebody's fear. He's not saying that anybody who does anything uh, courageous must be truly uh, a coward at heart. He's not trying to, to take down any of our idols here. What he is saying is that to be heroic can often be informed reflexively, psychologically, by the need to conquer our fear of, of dying and of being nothing, of being weak and frail and vulnerable. And that if one looks at hero myths, narratives, narratives of the dramatic apotheosis of man, as he calls it, uh, narratives where we conquer evil, these often involve the hero who surmounts tremendous obstacles, goes into the underworld, conquers the threat, death, and emerges unscathed, or at least he survives. And this fantasy, as it were, is what motivates not only the image of the hero, but our reflex of uh, psychological disposition to do courageous things. It is not the case that anybody who does something uh, heroic must be a coward, but that oftentimes we are so terrified of death that we will do things that are courageous and, and, and rare precisely to the degree to which most of us are terrified under ordinary conditions. When we talk about that we're terrified of death, yeah. we're not consciously terrified of it. We're, in other words, we're, we've repressed that fear. It's an unconscious thing we're yeah. talking about. Right? Well, this is an important thing to say about Becker. He's not claiming that all of us are walking around with a fear of death. Uh, this would be paralyzing in his view. Most of us uh, manage to repress it or deny it through fantasies, beliefs of afterlives and things like this. Culture itself provides the means through which we can attain uh, self-esteem or a, a, a feeling of, of belonging to something larger than ourselves. Uh, we can participate in cultural activities and beliefs and fantasies that deny death. So, in fact, most of us are not only uh, not fearing death, but 
the person who does fear death consciously and walks around feeling this kind of existential malaise and bemoaning existence is the exception, perhaps the, the neurotic exception. So now culture gives us ways of dealing with this fear of death. And one of the terms Becker uses is immortality symbols, immortality projects. What, can you tell us a little bit about what, what is an immortality symbol in Becker's terms? Well, for Becker, a symbol itself means something which does not inherently connote what meaning you give to it. So an immortality symbol is something that one person or a culture, for example, invests as something particularly permanent or everlasting or meaningful. So uh, an Egyptian pyramid, for example, while it is magically a device to to resurrect the pharaoh is, uh, aside from this magical function, a symbol of our need to create something that is permanent, that won't fade away, something made of stone that will last into uh, perpetuity, that will say, we uh, are not insignificant, we are not trans, and we have not passed away, turned into sand. This is something that is a monument to human existence. How about an yeah. empire or a, a corporation or or having a chair at a university named after you. Oh, I, I, I suspect that there are any number of personal investments that are symbolically providers of, of some sort of immortality. Again, symbolic, because people aren't deluded into thinking if they have a chair at a university that they're not going to die. Um, however, there is the sense I've created something that will last beyond me. This is what makes me something special, not insignificant, not something that's going to fade away. So there are any number of ways, Lifton calls this symbolic immortality, that we can invest ourselves in various kinds of pursuits to make ourselves feel uh, a sense of, of immortality or permanence. Uh, we can do this through works of art that will last beyond us, that will be something we've created that won't die and decay and pass away. Ovid says in the Metamorphoses that this poetry that he has created will make him immortal, that uh, neither Jove's sword nor uh, anything else will uh, render this non-existent. This is his immortality project. And there are innumerable immortality projects. Donald Trump happens to use uh, lots of uh, Can we power say that on television? I don't know. Oh, we'll bleep it out. Well, he has an edifice complex, <laughs> right? This is, this is uh, his immortality project. We all have these kinds of projects. That doesn't mean we all have such a manic drive to become immortal, but we try to invest ourselves in things that make us feel that we are continuing into the future. It could be our progeny. It could be our children. Again, it could be works of art. It could be the work we do for others. Jerry, uh, Becker says that real evil results from humans' struggle to heroically overcome evil. This seems like a paradox to me. Would you be able to uh, shed a little light on exactly what that means? Well, yeah, here's Becker's wonderful irony, that throughout history, so much of what has been done that we consider evil, the horrific violence, has been done to eradicate evil. That is to say that the Nazis thought they were exterminating what was evil to them, this thing which is going to infect their society as, as a disease, as something that is infecting their, their women, something that is corrupting the purity of their society. This is not just propaganda, not just a pretext. This is a fantasy. When there was violence in, in, in Bosnia, the Serbs genuinely thought that their lives and their existence was threatened, even though it may not have realistically been threatened. This is what they believed. So that so much of the violence we've acted out on one another, so much of our ideas of what evil is, of who our enemies are, is not necessarily could be, but it's not necessarily realistic. And so we as terrified people will uh, inflict violence upon them, thinking that we're doing the right thing, that we have no choice, right? Uh -huh. maybe, it, maybe it's a matter of necessity because we're threatened or because maybe God tells us that it's the right thing to do. Right. In, in either case, we imagine that we're, what we're doing is something that is truly wonderful and, ne and, and necessary for our uh, continued existence. Uh, Osama bin Laden and his uh, cohorts thought that they're Terrorism was blessed terrorism, that they had to do this to act out the will of Allah. This was not just something they would say in order to uh, influence people. There is this, uh, and I would call it a fantasy again, that God wants them to do this, that if they don't do it, then Allah will be angry. And the fact is that in the Quran, there are passages saying that if you don't kill uh, the infidels, then you yourself uh, will have your head stricken off, that you are not a good Muslim if you do not kill these infidels, these violators, these horrible people. It is one's moral duty to attack them. Now, that being said, it is the case that the Quran says that Allah does not love aggressors. But from this point of view, they are the ones acting defensively against a threat, and it is the moral duty to exterminate their enemies. And this is the kind of fantasy which recurs. 
aren't we doing the same thing yeah, in response? What, what's missing in the current Western system? Well, this does not mean that there aren't sometimes genuine threats. There aren't circumstances which necessitate some sort of political or military action. I would hardly say that if we warred against Hitler, we were merely trying to kill off evil in as equally a deluded way. What it would mean is that even when circumstances may require it, we still have the fantasy that this evil is a terrible threat and we must kill it off because we ourselves are threatened with extermination or that our gods, all of the blessed things in the universe, are making this acceptable. So even though terrorism may need to be eradicated in some way, and I'm not going to say how we should go about this, even if there is a genuine threat, we still can sometimes have this fantasy that it's a crusade, a crusade against evil. These are the words of our president. And this tends to mythologize the process of killing enemies such that they become inhuman. They become uh, less than we are. They become vile creatures that deserve to be exterminated. So does Becker's, uh, his, his use of the word scapegoat, does that enter into this at all? Or we... Oh, yes. And Becker's concept of the scapegoat is fascinating because not only does it draw upon uh, social science for, from the past century, he is invoking Durkheim's concept of the scapegoat and Freud's concept that victims can be chosen as a way of displacing aggression and anxiety from the community onto arbitrary victims. We have a history of communities that will choose victims ostensibly in arbitrary ways. Uh, for example, we have this example of the Greek Buphonia, for example, where a bull is the victim and all of the evil is displaced onto the bull. And then, of course, the knife is elected guilty because there's an anxiety that the killer will be contaminated with some sort of violence uh, and they don't want that happening. Or the pharmacos, where you have these two youths that receive all of the evil from the community, all of the contagion, and then are kicked out of the city never to return. So for Becker, we have this sacrificial mechanism that we will choose victims somewhat arbitrarily, like Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, to receive the evil. And it's kind of a magical process. It's not a rational process. Who will be deemed evil? We can witch hunts, for example, in history are an example of this. Uh, and they will be uh, executed and punished accordingly. However, if there are not necessarily genuine evils in the community. They will be chosen because we as a community have this need to displace all, all of our hatred and anxiety and frustration. We need to act it out. But furthermore, and this is where Becker gets really strange, and a lot of people won't accept this, Becker believes that the sacrificial victim in any community is also a gift, that we sacrifice something precious, and that warfare on some level and I know this is hard to swallow, that warfare on some level is the sacrifice of a precious commodity, which is our youth. We sacrifice our own people in warfare because this is a way of giving them to death rather than receiving it ourselves. If we can sacrifice individuals, it's not holy. just... It's not, a holy, it's that's a holy right. thing. Even if it's to. not ostensibly religious, right. Right. Right? Right. We, can, we can't sacrifice them, that's true, and this will avert death, but we also sacrifice our own people in his view because this is our most precious thing. And if we can sacrifice these members of our society, then we can avert evil ourselves and not be the recipients of some sort of random horrific death. This is Becker's view of war. How does all this relate to contemporary American events, what's going on with us right now? We're, all, we're at war right now in Afghanistan and Iraq. We've got murders in the city hall. I mean, we've got violence all around us. How does what we're talking about here relate to what's going on in the news? How should we reorient our thinking about it? Because we're kind of in lockstep as a, as a nation. You know what I mean? It's like we're saying, as we said at the beginning, how do we think differently about some of these things that we take for granted? Um, we lack a certain coherent narrative that gives us a sense of purpose and meaning uh, in our lives. We don't have a narrative that really tells us how to deal with life and death, certainly not one that binds communities as they used to. There are select communities that may have a cohesive belief, but we are multicultural. We have a variety of different stories which promise immortality, and factually they threaten one another. It's difficult to know what, uh, what to believe, and part of the problem for us is that we really lack coherent meaning systems. 
and that this, uh, at least in Becker's perspective, is what gives us a sense of anomie or purposelessness. And this is only one of the problems. Clearly, one can point to any number of economic problems, sociological problems, that there is um, there's so much deprivation that certain communities are more inclined to crime. There's a disparity of wealth so that certain communities are going to have various kinds of both economic and psychological problems relating to one another. There are innumerable flaws and facets of this problem. We rushed to war in the Middle East. Whether you agree with the politics or not, and even if, even if you say, yeah, you know, we're doing the right thing, still, there's something about the attitude of the American people. There's something about us as a nation and our attitude towards the war where I would think of thinking and feeling person would, would feel like, even if they said this is necessary, they would feel sad that we have to do this. They would feel sad that people are dying. Instead, it's like, we're celebrating. Okay, two things about this. First of all, I mean, this, this in a sense can go back to Hannah Arendt's idea that evil can be banal, right? We have committed various acts of violence in the past. We've, uh, the Korean War claimed over a million lives. Robert Lifton wrote this book, uh, Hiroshima, uh, Half Century of Denial. And we will rationalize the deaths of those destroyed in, uh, by atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki because we can say, well, they're the enemy. They deserved it. And I've had uh, many discussions with people where I've said, well, isn't it still tragic? Even if you claim, hypothetically, that there was no other choice, and that's debatable, but even if there, there was no other choice, isn't it tragic that so many people might have had to die for anything? Uh, can, can we say, honestly, that, that all of these people who died, all of these citizens who died, deserve to die because they were on the wrong side? Right? So there is a rationalization. There are psychological mechanisms where we, we numb ourselves or we use various excuses in order not to deal with it. And this is yet another case where so many atrocities can be committed and we could be in some sort of denial or numbing or avoidance of this whole issue. And it does avoid culpability. And that is a real tragedy for humanity. It's an ethical tragedy in one sense. But in another sense, and this really gets us back into Becker. There's a part of us which really enjoys the bloodshed. There's a part of us which really enjoys having an enemy, focusing all sorts of emotional issues, our terror of death uh, onto that enemy, having that enemy slaughtered and feeling a sense of, of heroic conquest over evil through that slaughter. So even if we might say in some circumstances we have no choice but to fight, this may or may not be one of those choices. There is still the fantasy and the incredible satisfaction that some of us, and I shouldn't say all, that many of us are going to get out of this kind of slaughter. And this kind of slaughter is going to make us feel powerful. It's going to make us feel that we've overcome death, our own vulnerability. And in this sense, it can be addictive. It can be so powerful an emotion. It can be so euphoric to conquer evil, to conquer death this way that we may really become addicted to it and search for enemies. And again, that brings us back to the scapegoating process, to this fantasy process of inventing enemies. We'll yeah, Jerry, thank you. Uh, our guest has been Dr. Jerry Piven. Jerry, thank you for an absolute terrific conversation. Well, thank you. A Super. pleasure. You've been listening to an interview with Jerry Piven, talking about violence, heroism, and fantasy in our society. Thank you, Jerry. Boy, there's nobody like Dr. Piven. No. <laughs> What's your takeaway from that, Steve? Well, Jerry identifies the fundamental notion that made me a lifelong fan of Ernest Becker. He says that throughout history, so much of what has been done that we consider evil has been done to eradicate evil. In other words, evil is done by right. people who believe they're doing good. Now, as a Catholic, I was brought up to believe that evil is a force, like the devil or something that bad people did. I never understood why. It never seemed real to me. This idea finally made sense and gave me a new perspective on the world we find ourselves in and people in general. It's a very powerful idea. Boy, that's, it's a huge idea. And I, I would have to say it's one of the most difficult ideas to wrap your head around that we're presenting yeah. in this whole approach. And and I think you said it well when you said that, you know, you were taught to believe that it's a, a separate entity outside of people. And I heard a quote recently, I think from, um, I think it was via Jordan Peterson, but from uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I'm almost sure, and he said that the line that divides good yeah. and evil runs through the heart of every person. And what that, and I, I got goosebumps when I heard that because you, 
can recognize something immediately when you hear that it's that a, a correct thing. We're all capable of doing evil, and we're all capable of incredible good. And it's not evil is not something out there. Evil is something that's in here, and each one of us is capable of it. And until you recognize that, you're still kind of out floating in the dark. And it exists for many different reasons. Yes, it does. I mean, there are some, there are certain people who are sociopaths, psychopaths. Yep. For them, evil, violence, killing, it's a way of life. It's matter of fact. Well, they, they're, getting, they're getting off on it in some way. Or it's a form of heroism or whatever. Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to come back to that, no doubt. Yes, absolutely. I was struck with the idea. Jerry said, we lack a coherent narrative that gives us a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. This is a central problem in a secular society. To my mind, it's at the heart of much of the suffering, physical and psychological, that our society experiences. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I know for a lot of people, they still have a functioning religion, but for many more people, I think now in this modern world, we're living mostly in a secular society. And it used to be the religion that, that gave us the central narrative that everything was hanging on. And now we don't really have that anymore. We try to get it from disparate places and things, but there isn't one central thing like there always was. I think we're still looking for that. I tried to write about this when I, when I wrote a chapter on Darwin and mm -hmm. how our society, elements of our society, I should say, reject Darwinism. Yeah. They reject evolution, natural selection, not just because, you know, they don't like to think they were descended from monkeys or whatever, but because it takes away the meaning of their lives. Right. Because Darwin's saying, you're an animal and you're no more significant than your dog or, you know, any other animal and you're going to die and you're going to be worm food and the human mind just rebels so we don't we don't like you that. know the, the way the mind is no the way the mind is wired from what i understand the literature i've seen your brain uses certain circuits to think about the death of other people but uses a different part of your brain to think about your own death or to suppress or to suppress so, the thinking about your own death it literally occurs in a different part of the brain wow and we all suppress the knowledge, the inevitability of our own death. We wouldn't be sitting here doing this podcast if we right. weren't repressing. We'd be out, you know, having fun. But Darwin is a direct threat to your purpose and meaning. And I think that's why he's been rejected and why they certain parts of the country use the British pronunciation evolution. And I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, it's evolution. Oh wow! I'd never heard that. Yeah, you're 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 a northeasterner. What can I tell you? <laughs> That's true. So anyway, this is this is a disturbing one. When Jerry talked about war, killing our enemies, makes us feel powerful. It makes us feel that we've overcome death. So the question is, how do we end war if it has this psychological purpose that seemingly all people share? Wow! What a and and. Yeah, it's incredible thought, right? Yes, it is indeed. And what uh, this is the this is at the heart of the book White Noise, the novel, novel White Noise by Don DeLello. I'm not familiar with it. it. It's interesting. It's a fiction, and that's his premise that killing makes us feel powerful and that we've overcome death. And it is actually a way some people are introduced to these ideas through this this story that he wrote. I don't know how long ago, but you should check it out. Does he mention Becker? No, not in the not in the book. Okay, but he but he does give Becker attribution when asked about it, or you know when he was interviewed uh -huh. about the book. Interesting. Yeah. Well, this this now sure is a mighty complex subject, Steve. Oh yeah, yeah. It's all very disturbing. Uh, what's coming next week? Well, our next episode will feature cultural critic Kirby Farrell talking about consumer utopia or factory prison. Well, that actually may or may not be true, Steve. We, <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. We, we're t as we were talking about a minute ago, we found some interviews uh, that have not been heard before, and one of those is from recently deceased Neil Elgy, a hero of ours, 
And we're actually going to take a listen to that and possibly do that ahead of Dr. Farrell. We'll figure out how to use some of these. You know, we have some other interviews in the vault. Not that there's a real vault, but sitting on the shelf, we need to play back and listen to, maybe transcribe, figure out what we're going to do with them. But yeah, certainly Niels is an important one because, like you say, he is one of our heroes. Just an incredible, incredible man. Yes, he is. Uh, And we miss him. Yes, we do. So we have a choice between next week hearing uh, an interview with one of our heroes or another cultural critic, one that we learned a great deal from, Kirby Farrell, one or the other. Right. And we'll get to both of them eventually, no matter what. Right. Yep. So join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. And support us on Patreon. Thank you for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well. Stay well.